there's a lot actually to uh, to to talk about. Um, so uh, to start with, uh, why we're talking about this or what has happened in the last um, uh, few uh, few weeks is that about a month ago, the Dutch government decided to impose a curfew uh, in order to uh, pretend to act very uh, decisively against the coronavirus. Uh, I think this this curfew is very much a symbolic measure uh, meant to mask uh, the fact that the health crisis, the corona crisis is, um, has, has been handled very uh, poorly by the uh, by the government and by um, imposing a curfew. I think what they tried to do was uh, to point uh, attention to the general public and to pretend that it's not the, uh, uh, the, the government who's uh, mishandled this, but um, uh, the general public who haven't been able um, or, or who are not um, doing enough to uh, comply with the uh, measures and to pro provide mainly a scapegoat. I think uh, they actively, they calculated that uh, it would most be, mostly be urban youth that would get uh, fined. Um, now, I don't want to go into, uh, uh, into detail uh, too much on the, the whole corona uh, mismanagement, but I think it's important to see that the mismanagement of the corona uh, crisis by the government has um, helped the uh, far right and the conspiracy theorists to gain a semblance of, uh, uh, of credibility. So um, the far right uh, corona denialist demonstrations have been going uh, uh, for about a year. Um, and the, their movement has, has managed to mobilize uh, significant numbers of people. Uh, the biggest uh, uh, protests attracted uh, several thousand people, which is really big. Um, I think um, it hasn't happened that the far right has mobilized that many uh, people uh, in the Netherlands since uh, 1945. Um, and when the, uh, the, the curfew was imposed, the corona deniers, uh, the COVID deniers, they escalated their, their alarmist rhetoric saying the fascism is gonna be imposed and uh, stuff, uh, stuff like that. And they decided to defy the ban on their, uh, uh, on their demonstrations. Um, so um, the first uh, time this happened was um, in Amsterdam at the Museum Plein, there there was a, um, a protest uh, planned. It was uh, banned by the municipal uh, government, but uh, about 2,000 people showed up um, and organized fascists were uh, there and they came prepared um, and uh, they felt strong enough to uh, to seek the confrontation uh, with the police. So this led to, uh, to uh, fierce riots. Um, then uh, a day later, um, uh, something similar happened in Eindhoven, in the in the south of the country, uh, where a coalition or, of Pegida, uh, the the, the anti-Muslim racist uh, group, uh, COVID denialists, uh, and football hooligans um, banded together and uh, and basically uh, basically tried to outdo uh, what had happened in uh, in Amsterdam. Now, I think the. The first thing to note is that actually what happened next was there, uh, there were two very distinct uh, things that have been thrown together uh, most mostly. Um, the first is what we've been talking about right now, this, these far-right uh, protests that ended in violence. Uh, but second, uh, a few days later, there were uh, also riots in the cities that were not directly connected uh, to, uh, to to COVID denialist protests, uh, but that um, were basically uh, migrant youth, uh, non-white youth in the cities that came into conflict uh, conflict with police, um, that went into poor, poorer neighborhoods um, uh, with a great show of force and tried to uh, uh, well quell any uh, uh, anyone who was on the uh, on the street, and. When this happened, uh, the media attention and political attention, of course, shifted very much uh, to the cities, even though the scale of these 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 riots, I think, were uh, were smaller uh, than the the, the earlier uh, riots. And well, the media um, shifted back to their comfortable uh, racist outrage about uh, uh, young uh, uh, Moroccan Moroccan youth and other non-white uh, youth. Um, so I think 
um, it's important to see that these two um, um, types of rights have, have, a, have a different character. First uh, was very much um, political. Uh, the second had much, much more to do with um, young people uh, uh, showing up out of, uh, out of curiosity, but also uh, just uh, poverty, small housing, uh, people, you know, trying to get out of the uh, house and, uh, and and seeing what's what's up with the uh, the, the rioting with the with the police. Now, uh, initially, um, the the far right party, so uh, PVV, Geert Wilders uh, uh, party, and Forum for Democracy (FED), which is um, uh, more like a neo-fascist uh, party. Um, they both uh, uh, supported um, the, the the riots. I think FAD went furthest in this um, by even um, uh, at one point speaking out uh, directly in uh, in support, but uh, deleting their uh, tweets. Uh, in the town of Uruk, uh, which is a small uh, fishing community, uh, the local PVV uh, directly incited uh, local youth. Um, that uh, that ended up uh, rioting and burning down a COVID uh, test location. Uh, it also seems that the places where these these times of, of of violence broke out, that there was a connection between uh, what happened recently and what has happened in the last couple of years. So, for example, Eindhoven uh, saw big riots, and there was a lot of um, um, outrage about. Where, where this come from uh, came from all of a sudden, uh, but actually in the uh, last few years, um, uh, racist far right football hooligans had been attacking anti racist anti black beat um, uh, uh, protesters. So there was uh, a, a basis already for what happened uh, uh, recently. Now again, when um, uh, and the same thing happened in Urk, uh, by the way, where uh, local youth had tried last year tried to lynch uh, a, a Moroccan family and, and got into their uh, homes and, and, and beat them and uh, uh, well uh, stuff stuff like that. So there have been more uh, in, in most of these localities. There had been uh, uh, far um, uh, yeah far far right violence. Uh, so when um, the the rioting shifted to the the inner city uh, neighborhoods, uh, the response of the far right hooligans, the far right football uh, hooligans shifted as well. So all, all of a sudden you saw uh, um, hooligan groups in different parts of the countries um, who were probably connected to the, the group in Eindhoven. They uh, said, oh, we're going to defend our cities. They offered their services to the police. Um, and they went onto the street to seek uh, confrontation with uh, the with, uh, uh, youths who were supposedly um, uh, rioting. In a lot of places, they were just marching in the streets, but there weren't any uh, uh, rioting going on. But these were far right groups that were out for uh, for violence and the response from the local police was uh, usually very uh, positive. Uh, so it was welcomed that these uh, um, these uh, these guys took to the street. And uh, the most shameful uh, incident was um, in Alkmaar, where um, Emil Rumer, who was the former leader of the Socialist Party, which is the most left wing party uh, in Parliament uh, right now. Um, basically led uh, the fascist march, march for two uh, um, uh, nights in a row, uh, intimidating uh, a journalist along the way. They went uh, with a police escort, and he said it was unusually positive that people were would take um, the responsibility uh, like this. So um, I think uh, a problem with these, well, factually fascist style uh, squads was that they, they were in the media welcomed as um, people taking the re uh, responsibility. Um, but um, in fact, it was a, well, a very, very dangerous uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, and I think you see why it's important to, to really um, uh, take apart these, these, uh, what happened because um, probably most of these groups that 
that were so supposedly protecting their cities would have been rioting and fighting the police uh, had had the situation been a little bit uh, different, just like their friends in uh, Eindhoven uh, uh, had had done. Um, now there were some um, uh, on the left. There were some people who were. Uh, positive about these riots and who uh, just focused on what happened in the cities and completely disregarded the far uh, right. Uh, for example, uh, Willem Schinkel, who is a sociology professor, he took a classic ultra left standpoint uh, in a uh, national newspaper um, and he he pointed uh, rightly, I think, to the racist mar marginalization of uh, inner city youth, uh, to neoliberalization, uh, poverty, uh, people who uh, turn 25, 30 be before they can leave their, their, their house um, or their parents' house, the, the housing crisis, all these uh, social um, um, uh, causes of of, uh, of of the riots. And, uh, but what he then proceeded to do was to suggest that they were therefore uh, political and Im implicitly anti-capitalist, that these were not just caused by poverty and capitalism and neoliberalism, but they were also implicitly uh, a, a fight against uh, uh, it. And he admitted that they wouldn't achieve anything, but at least something was being done. Um, what he said was, uh, finally, the powers that be are uh, are being challenged. Um, though telling he, he himself didn't uh, join the, uh, the, 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 the rioting. Um, so for, fortunately, um, I, uh, there were much better uh, responses, uh, usually from the neighborhoods uh, themselves. So in Bijlmer, in Amsterdam, in the Schilderswijk, in uh, The Hague, uh, local people and um, uh, oftentimes anti-racist activists went uh, went out and tried to dissuade uh, uh, young people from uh, rioting, explaining that the cause of the um, uh, corona denialist wasn't their cause and that it would only uh, get them uh, in trouble and play into the, the, the hands of, of, of uh, uh, racist uh, scapegoats. Uh, uh, um, but uh, I think what's what's maybe more important is that um, the what what is this most of the responses to the the rise made clear is that there's still a lot of confusion on the left concerning the nature of the far right and especially concerning um, what these corona denialist uh, uh, demonstrations really uh, uh, represent. Um, so on the right side of the left, uh, the, the more uh, liberal left liberal uh, parties such as the, the, the Green Party, they usually just deny the existence of the far right um, or they ignore uh, what's happening. So they denounce uh, these protests in, in moral terms, uh, but they just see it as um, uh, as, a, as a very conservative and, and not really as a um, extreme right fascist style uh, movements. There are, of course, exceptions, um, but they're mostly isolated uh, cases. And um, I think one very telling example uh, about this general stance was uh, given only a few years ago when the teachers union um, actually broke uh, protocol because the teach the unions in the Netherlands have, uh, have said that they will not be uh, giving the PVV uh, a platform uh, because of their racism. Uh, but uh, the teachers union uh, invited the PVV uh, MP to an uh, uh, election debate. Uh, what happened next was that members spoke out against this and instead of just withdrawing the invitation to PVV, um, to the PVV, they canceled the whole uh, event. Um, and what happened then was that the Liberal uh, Democratic uh, MP publicly spoke out that um, debate and, and the, uh, democracy were um, well, were the same thing and it was uh, undemocratic uh, not to uh, gain a platform to a disgusting racist uh, party that has recently uh, called to uh, establish a, a ministry to oversee uh, complete ethnic cleansing of the uh, country. Um, 
So this is a, a very weak uh, uh, response. Um, now on the other end of the spectrum, there are, are people like uh, Schinkel, who we are, uh, already mentioned, uh, who basically recycles uh, the old views uh, of the communist parties, of the, the Stalinist uh, style communist parties on, on classical uh, fascism, though he arrives at the same conclusions from, from a very different, uh, on a, in a very different way. So uh, according to Schinkel, there is no uh, fundamental difference between what he calls uh, the order or the liberal order uh, and fascism. He says that uh, the far right, uh, right are a threat, but they are no, no more a threat than the Green Party or the Social Democrats. And actually, he says, um, maybe the Greens and the Social Democrats are a little bit more uh, dangerous because the far right is at least uh, um, uh, is, is well, is, is, he basically says that um, the, the far right acts as an, a support for the order. And if you um, accept um, that there could be something worse, uh, such as, as fascism, then you will um, help legitimize this current uh, state of affairs or, uh, or, or something. Um, I think this, this contradicts the, the, the well-known fact, I think, that uh, any serious critique of historical fa fascism implies a critique of the cap capitalist system that gave rise to, uh, to it. Um, still, I think there's some merit in Schinkel's argument because what he at least does is he tries to expose the, the structural racist violence happening at the European borders, for example, trying to highlight uh, the racism of center parties, uh, the authoritarian dynamics of neoliberalism, but by, you know, um, blurring the difference between fascism and any other kind of violence and to hide these very big differences, I think, behind the abstract terms, he, you know, relativizes these, these things away. And I think um, it's, you know, um, very dangerous thought to think that uh, however bad it is now, uh, something like physical extermination of, of, uh, of non-white people or something cannot happen again because it, because it did. Um, so that's, a, I think, a dangerous um, uh, underestimation of the danger of the far, uh, far right. Uh, now, what both, both these uh, interpretations have in common is that they deny the specific character of fascism as uh, a, um, a mass movement of uh, the petit bourgeoisie, of, of small entrepreneurs usually, um, that is distinct from even the most racist authoritarian uh, a bourgeois uh, party. I think uh, it's important to see that classical fascism was not directly um, a, a big business uh, enterprise. It was uh, made up of, uh, it, it was a mass movement that was made up from all sorts of small entrepreneurs that got into a very, um, 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 in a, in a situation where they felt uh, very much uh, threatened. Um, now, I think a, th a third view that you sometimes hear or see uh, is a, a bit more sophisticated. It comes from socialists who do understand the history of fascism and the Marxist interpretation of fa fascism, but they uh, interpret it in a very schematic and mechanical uh, way. So they do understand that fascism is a mass movement uh, with a petit bourgeois character that in, aims to completely destroy the left in all of its uh, forms. So not just parties, trade unions, but up to the, the very small uh, level. Uh, however, the argument they make is that there's, um, you should equate fascism to the, um, uh, the, um, the, the organized fighting formations that you, you uh, had, so, such as the uh, Faschi di Combattimento uh, in, uh, in Italy, uh, the SA, uh, Hitler's SA, or the black, black shirts of the uh, British Union of, uh, of Fascists. Um, and I think it's important to see that these organized fighting formations were very central 
to uh, uh, to fascism, but they they shouldn't be disconnected from the various other elements. And what they basically do is make a conditio sine qua non uh, out of this. So if there are fascist bands in uniform, it's fascism. If there's not, it's definitely not fascism. Um, now I want to name two uh, problems with uh, with this uh, approach. The first is that it doesn't really fit uh, the historical uh, experience of fascism. So if you look uh, at uh, the history of the British Union of Fascists in the 1930s, their parliament, their uh, paramilitary force, uh, uh, the, the, the Black Shirts, they started out as whole, uh, a whole security uh, uh, force. And only like two years after they were formed uh, was the first real, um, uh, were the first real clashes between um, the, the black shirts and anti-fascist uh, protesters during the so-called Olympia incident when uh, anti-fascists uh, went into a, uh, a hall um, where, uh, where the um, fascist leader mostly spoke and black shirts attacked them and, and beat them uh, uh, senseless and uh, basically um, created this, this public outrage because they uh, finally showed um, their their violent uh, uh, their violent nature. Um, now, if you really believe that uh, fascism needs in uh, if uh, that it's not fascism without these organized fighting groups, then you should say that the British Union of Fascists was not a, not a fascist movement in 1933 uh, uh, or uh, or 32, but it only became fascist in uh, 34, which I think. Is, um, uh, is, is absurd. But what we should see is that, um, and you could say uh, uh, similar things about the, the Nazi party in Germany in the 1920s. Um, so I think what we should see is that um, these fighting formations are definitely an inherently uh, important part of, the, uh, uh, of fascism, but fascism develops over, over time and um, they uh, they shift uh, tactics, um, so they don't always feel strong enough to to organize these groups. Now the second point is that when we look at neo-fascist parties or, and movements that have started to uh, emerge after uh, the Second World War, what they have done is they try to uh, adapt to a political context in which these organized uh, uniformed uh, fighting groups are not generally accepted. Uh, and where everybody knows about the horrors of fascism and the Holocaust. So what they try to do is they try to um, uh, to hide their true colors for as long as they uh, can. And uh, instead of trying to organize street violence right away, they try to work towards a situation in which they can do that, uh, do uh, build these, these uh, groups. Um, so uh, the most important thing I think is to be a, that they try to push the ide ideological boundaries or what's, uh, what's uh, sometimes called the uh, Overton Wyndham so far to the right that they can um, portray fascist aggression against the ethnic mi minorities and the left as um, noble acts of self-defense against enemies of the uh, people. Um, and again, I think, this is something that neo-fascists have been doing consciously, but if you zoom out and you look at classical, classical fascism, you see that, um, that uh, something similar went on um, uh, in, in these classical examples. So in Germany, this is uh, obscured a bit because when the Nazi party appeared on the scene in the early 1920s, there had already been decades of ideological preparation with the anti-Semitic movements and all that. Uh, they, they had been a, a familiar feature of uh, uh, um, German political life since the 1890s. Um, there was already the, the, the legend that the left had supposedly um, uh, led to the uh, betrayed the country and led to the defeat of the um, uh, uh, German Reich in the um, uh, in the First World War. So there had already been um, uh, um, a lot of uh, ideological pre pre sorry preparation. But if you look um, 
at uh, uh, British fascism again, um, you can see that actually what the British Union of Fascists did was they didn't uh, uh, proclaim that uh, they were going to abolish democracy and murder their political opponents, but what they did was they called themselves fascists, but they uh, portrayed themselves as a, a defender of the freedom of uh, of speech. So they, what they said was that anti-fascists were a threat to uh, freedom of speech and democracy, and that fascist violence was a way to uh, safeguard uh, freedom of uh, uh, of speech. Um, in the same way, they said that the newspapers were controlled by a left elite, and uh, that on, uh, real, uh, true free speech could only be instituted under fascism when the people finally could speak freely, uh, though only through the mouth of uh, the, the fascist leader. Um, so you can see why I think we should look more to um, the British Union of Fascists, because a lot of the things they did in the 1930s are very, very similar uh, to uh, what's happening now on the, on the far right. So, now, how, how should we view uh, the rise of the far right and the Gulf of the Nihilists in, in particular? Um, I think broadly what we've seen in the, in the last two decades in, in the Netherlands is that uh, racist and far right propaganda coming from far right websites such as uh, Geen Stijl, uh, from far right politicians such as Wilders and, uh, um, and Pim for Time before him, have prepared the ground for um, a broader far-right movement, uh, far-right conspiracy uh, uh, theories. Um, and you can see that these, um, these uh, conspiracy theories take on the, 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 the same main myth that most of the classical fascists use, may, mainly that there is an internal uh, threat, an internal enemy that we cannot really see, but it's on the verge of winning, or maybe it has already won, uh, but it's going to enslave us, and only a desperate struggle for survival can stop them, uh, which involves a national rebirth and a reconnection to um, our um, racial, mythical roots or something. So um, Jerry Baudet uh, of the FAD, of the Forum for Democracy, is very outspoken in uh, in this and the same uh, type of rhetoric you can see from uh, Willem Engel, who is the, the leader of the COVID deniers. Uh, he claims, for example, that COVID is part of a global conspiracy to, to impose a communist dictatorship, uh, a communist, a communist dictatorship that can only be def, uh, averted by an uprising of the people. Uh, now, Cherry Baudet's party, FAD, is the, was the real first real conscious effort to start and form a, a neo-fascist uh, party uh, out of the much broader far-right uh, milieu that has uh, started to um, to come into being in the in the last uh, two two decades. Um, uh, what he has been do uh, doing, he's been doing a lot of things, but one of the things he's been doing is trying to really um, 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 how do you call it? Um, they, what he dared to do, I think for the first time was really um, start justifying uh, far right aggression towards the left and, uh, and racist, racist violence as well. So when there were riots in 2015 against uh, refugees in the town of, uh, of Geldermalse, uh, he said this was a uh, self-defense against um, an injection of criminality into our uh, into our society, uh, and when uh, far-right extremists attacked uh, Black Pete, uh, uh, um, anti-Black Pete uh, protesters, he called them uh, heroes and called the anti-racist uh, uh, terrorists. Um, now, but these. I think our examples of are, are, is, is what we've been calling DIY fascism. So we've had, we've had years of alarmist far-right conspiracy theories, uh, all sorts of uh, propaganda and lies about the, the left. And what we've seen in the last three years, I think, um, is groups of people who are not organized fascists, but who are mobilized through far-right 
uh, conspiracy theories and take uh, action themselves. Um, so these are um, what you say objectively fascist movements, but they they don't organize uh, um, uh, uh, that way. Um, I think the same thing can be said about what what or something similar can be said about um, the the COVID denial uh, protests. These have been um, drawing much more people on the street than the far right has been able to mobilize up till now. Um, so they're trying, they're starting to 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 get a mass uh, following. Um, and some people, if you look at um, these uh, these protests, you could see, you you see um, different types of people. So you've got the old. Um, uh, neo-Nazi groups, you've got the, the new conspiracy theories, uh, theorists, the neo-fascists, you've got football hooligans, but then there's a, and, and, and you see this in a lot of uh, countries, um, you see these esoteric sort of hippie uh, type uh, people who preach uh, love and understanding, but at the same time they follow um, fascist uh, 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 rhetoric. Um, so What's, what's often said about these people is that, uh, or these protests is, is that uh, it's a very mixed uh, uh, thing. And I think it's, it's a mistake to look at it this, uh, this way. The fact that people who do not think of themselves as fascists or do, who do not look uh, like the typical fascists that we have in mind uh, uh, points uh, to the fact that fascism is really becoming a, a, a mass movement and is starting to mobilize beyond uh, what, what they could mobilize in the 90, uh, 1990s, for, for example. So what, what, um, what these um, movements are objectively uh, far right, and I think the, the, the people who attend these uh, um, protests are objectively uh, part of it. So they may not know, to, to paraphrase Marx, they may not know they are right-wing extremists and they may not think of uh, themselves that, that way, but they are doing exactly uh, uh, what uh, right-wing extremists would do. They are mobilized through far-right uh, propaganda, they follow far-right uh, uh, leaders, and, um, and they talk uh, far-right nonsense. Um, so I think it's, it's again very important to, um, to see that um, classical fascism was never a socially marginal uh, thing. It was always uh, a broad uh, mass movement involving all, all sorts of uh, uh, people. Um, and if you uh, uh, if you look at uh, f fascism in Germany, for example, there were all uh, a, a whole bunch of uh, of people who believed into all sort uh, all sorts of mysticism who were deceived by. Um, uh, uh, conspiracy theories, and I think is um, the, the the fact that we're seeing stuff like this again, and it's not just you know the the young bold headed uh, boot boys is uh, exactly what makes uh, uh, this this current situation uh, so so dangerous. <laughs>